we'll be able to wrap up chapter 11. Uh, we'll do chapter 12 and maybe that last module next time, depending on uh, time. And then um, I'm still working on getting us somebody to talk to us about data analytics for our uh, extra credit. Uh, which at this point it will simply be them coming in and talking to us and us writing something up. Uh, worst case scenario, I'll just have you guys with a one page or whatever you know, that about data analytics. It's just something you have to do uh, to get through it. Um, you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and have you sign in today. Uh, I know a couple people have sort of checked out of the class here the last couple of uh, times and I am not going to let uh, folks do data analytics if they're not coming to do uh, the extra credit if they're not coming to class. You know, if they're not going to come to class, I'm not going to help them with data analytics um, with extra credit because uh, you know, put the name, yeah. because the sense is that you know, you're not doing well in the class because you're not in the class. So in the class, then you get a better grade. So um, I will not allow people that are missing class to uh, take advantage of the extra credit. Okay. Um, just want to make sure we're recording now, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you're not in class, you're not going to be allowed to do the data analytics. Okay. I mean the extra credit on data analytics. Okay, so what are we going to look at here now in chapter 11 and um, then really looking at chapter, um, also looking, we won't do it tonight, but looking at chapter uh, 12, last couple of classes where we headed. Uh, we're going to talk about some final steps in the audit. We're going to be talking about some really sort of administrative requirements, communication, with management, communication with those charged with governance, uh, some of our final wrap-up review procedures at the end of the engagement. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, basic uh, things that we have to have in order to issue a uh, certain type of an opinion, uh, have it be unqualified, qualified, etc. So we're going to start to bring in some of those terms, even though we haven't really studied the reporting requirements, the um, types of opinion yet. That would be the subject of chapter 12. And then in that last module, I forget what module it is, it's on the syllabus, um, we will also start to talk about um, you know, some other services that can be provided other than audit services, which is what most of our focus has been so far. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead, though, and um, can you hit one of those, start flipping this switch at one of these times? Okay, turn it off. Okay, I think that's a good way. Yeah, okay. I think that's working. That's fine. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start to take a look then at Chapter 11, completing the audit. And you can see that we have an audit timeline here. And obviously, you have the beginning of the year. And you could do some interim testing. Remember, we said interim testing would be done if you had, what, a low risk of material misstatement. You could then what alter the timing of your audit procedure, move to interim testing instead of your end testing. So interim testing might be done, for example, in September, right? Okay, and uh, then the year in December. You would always have to do. We're going to see some roll forward work. I'll talk about that. But uh, you could do some work at interim. Okay. Then what? Well, we have the year end, and we go ahead and we complete our audit procedures. And we're going to be spending some time with these areas here, the attorney letters, um, the written representation, management representation, going concern assessment, uh, review of audit documentation, something called subsequent events. Subsequent events are those events that uh, we really discover the full subject matter of those after the year end. So it's subsequent to year end, but before the issue, of the financial statements. Now, we are going to be responsible for subsequent discovery of facts uh, even after the date of our audit report. And that will extend all the way out to the audit report release date that there may be some things that we'll discover 
that will cause us to want to reissue the financial statements, et cetera. Okay? So we're going to be talking about these things that are happening near the end of the engagement and even happening after we've completed our audit work. We've um, issued, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, dated our audit report, we've completed our audit work, but we haven't issued the report yet. We're going to still have some certain responsibilities. Okay. All right, good. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these things here. And let's talk about first um, roll forward procedures. So what are we talking about? Well, let's say we've decided to do some interim testing. So the year begins January 1st, let's say. And let's say we do some interim testing in September. Say it's September 30th. Okay, and then the year end is going to be December 31st. Well, if we do our interim testing at September 30th, but the client's year end of the financial statements is what? Is December 31st, there's still transactions that would have occurred after we maybe have already performed our substantive procedures, after we've already performed some of our internal controls. Standards require that you do some work to make sure that things haven't gone to hell in a handbasket from the date that you tested at September 30th to the end of the year. So, what would be some roll forward procedures? Well, for example, we might look at our financial information at September 30th, which constitutes, what, three quarters of the year, and then multiply everything by what? By 1.5. To five to see if the numbers seem <coughs> reasonable, or we look at everything multiplied by 0.25, see if everything was reasonable for that last quarter of the year. Okay, we might do some limited analytical procedures, so we would go ahead and compare the end of year uh, numbers to last year's end of year numbers, or last year's end of quarter numbers to this year's end of quarter numbers. But we have to do something. The takeaway of roll forward is. We have to do something to satisfy ourselves that it is reasonable meeting our expectations to what happened to the last quarter of the year. You can't just close your eyes and say, okay, nothing weird happened. You've got to check it out. Maybe we'll pull a smaller sample of transactions, and we'll look at that smaller sample of transactions for that last quarter of the year just to look to see that the controls are still having operating effectiveness, that we don't see anything strange coming up in those last quarter substantive procedures, et cetera. Okay, but you must do something with those procedures, and we call that roll forward. Okay, question on that? Okay, got to do something to satisfy yourself for that last quarter of the year if you did your testing in interim. Okay, good. Now, we talk about analytical procedures, and remember we said that we what? We are required to do analytical procedures in the planning phase. Talked about that back in a few chapters ago. But we're also required to do them during the final review stage. Okay, now if we want to, optional, we could do an analytical procedure as a substantive procedure. It's not required, it is optional that you could use an analytic as a substantive procedure. So remember, we talked about the washing machine revenue. And we said that we wanted to do an analytical procedure to get ourselves satisfied with the washing machine revenue was fairly stated. So we looked at the gallons of water that were used, compared that to what they reported as washing machine revenue to see if that was reasonable. That would be an example of using it as an analytical procedure. These that we do as planning and as final review procedures are high level. It is simply for the planning phases seeing if we see anything strange as to our expectation the financial reports that we compare last year to this year, etc. So if something falls out of a certain tolerance, we know to cast a spotlight on that um, when we're doing our planning. Final review has a similar focus, and that after our client has gone through 
they finished up their financials, all of the things now are ready to be issued. We're still going to do a set of analytics just to make sure that in all that process of completing the financial statement, nothing strange got booked into the financials that would need another look. So I'll be doing another set of final review procedures, analytics, final review procedures at the end. So you're required to do them at the beginning, you're required to do them near the end to see if there's anything weird that came out that had not been previously identified. You're going to do this very close to your, uh, your uh, uh, the date of your audit report. Okay? Question? Okay, good. Why does it feel like there's still more shiny on here than there should be? I think I'm used to having this light off, right? This front light all the way off? Too much glare coming out of my head. Okay, now uh, you take a look at accounting estimates. Financial statements are full of accounting estimates, and we're going to see that when we write our report, we will say that we consider significant estimates that are made by management. Right? This is something that you'd probably get a comfort level with towards the end of the engagement because now management has finished up all their calculations of the amounts needed in the allowance for loan loss, the amounts that are needed for depreciation, etc. Often these things are booked towards the end of the year, right? So we would want to be comfortable and review estimates for reasonableness, and that's probably going to happen towards the end of the year. And the best way to get comfortable with management estimates is to what? Recalculate. Develop your own estimate. Compare that to management estimate. Okay? Okay, good. <coughs> now, litigation claim and assessment. We are going to do this near the end of the engagement because we want to understand is... Uh, the company going to be subject to any sort of uh, litigation. Okay, now we're going to see that we're going to be talking to management about any litigation claim and assessments that they have. Management should know that, right? So we'll sit down with them and we'll what say, hey, can you tell us about any litigation claim and assessment you're under? We will also want to review minutes and meetings of stockholders, directors, committees, because often these litigation claims and assessments, these lawsuits will be talked about in those minutes because they're talking about these things to the board of directors. Um, I was on an engagement where I was looking at, we were looking at how the National Credit Union Administration was looking at something called corporate credit unions. I might have, might have talked about corporate credit unions before. Corporate credit unions are basically clearing houses for other credit unions. So all of their checks and whatnot process through one central corporate credit union. They're located across the United States. And so Congress had some concern that maybe these corporate credit unions had some of the exposure and they wanted to make sure that the NCUA was putting the proper uh, regulatory procedures on these uh, corporate credit unions. So we went ahead and took a look at that, and we got assigned so many that I had to look at. And um, one of them that I looked at was sitting there, and they were getting a what they call a camel rating of one consistently. And then all of a sudden, which is good, we're going to scale one to four. And then all of a sudden, they started getting a CAMEL rating. This is a rating from the NCUA of four. So from one quarter to the next, they went from a one to a four. I'm like, how did they get that, that quicker? So I started looking more into the, uh, the board of directors' minutes. And all of a sudden, I start seeing around that same time discussion of the suit, the suit, but no real details to what's going on. So I'm like, OK. Something is wrong here, okay? How do they go from a one to a four and all of a sudden talk about the suit and what's going on with the suit? So 
I reach out to the NCUA and I say, well, what's going on here? What was the suit? Okay, it turns out that one of the members of the board of directors was involved with one of the employees, and the employees started thinking that, you know, they were the boss. And so at that point, because the uh, CEO wasn't able to do his job quite as well, he resigned. So all of a sudden, there was this big vacuum of experience and whatnot. And so NCUA said, hey, we're going to put you at four. But seeing that in the minutes to the board of directors meetings and what was going on with that, even though that color was not provided there, it can get, lead you to what? To additional inquiries that will somehow uncover some things that may be of a potential concern, maybe need to be disclosed or whatever, right? Okay. So that's really what you should be getting out of those uh, stockholders, directors. Is there any red flags in there is what you're looking for, okay? Again, review contracts, loan agreements, correspondence from taxing authorities. I mean, if all of a sudden you start seeing all these letters from the IRS saying, hey, there's a tax deficiency or you haven't filed returns, etc. again, we may need to uh, have some disclosures, maybe even need to book some liabilities. Okay, et cetera, review documents. But the key step that must be done on every engagement in this area, okay, you're gonna do these other things, inquire and whatnot, but you must have direct communication between the CPA and the client's attorney. Okay, now if they don't have an external attorney, then it's gonna have to be their in-house counsel. But there has to be direct communication between the CPA and the client's attorney. Now, this chart shows that the letter to the attorney, which is making inquiries about litigation, claim, and assessment, is prepared by the client. It's on the client's letterhead. It's asking the attorney to respond. Is there any litigation, claim, and assessment that we need to uh, be aware of? But then, the letter is handed from, well, frankly, so what you would do is you would say, can I please have your letterhead to the client? And you would print what the letter is supposed to look like because there's been an agreement between the American Bar Association and the AICPA as to what the nature of these letters would look like because what? Attorneys don't want to be following our rules and we have to follow our rules. So they came to an agreement as to what goes on the letter. Okay, and so we go ahead and we have this form letter that we print on the client's letterhead. We show it to the client. The client probably has their in-house in attorneys look at it, their in-house legal look at it, whatever. They hand it back to us. We control and mail that to the client's attorney. The client attorney responds back directly to the CPA. Okay, this is so that we make sure that we're getting what direct external information. And in there, the attorney will talk about any litigation claim and assessment, talk about the possibility of an unfavorable outcome. So, hey, if there's a, um, right, which one? Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, so if there's, um, if they say that it is probable, that there'll be an unfavorable outcome, what are we supposed to do? We would put the estimate liability to a current period. Good, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna debit the loss, and we're gonna credit the liability in the current period, right? Okay, now if it's probable that you should have asked me, is it 50%? No, if I tell you it's probable, that means it's 50% or more, but it also has to be what? Can, if we say it's probable that there's a loss, is it okay for management to go and you know take a shot at the key and say, well, I think the loss is this much, and that's what they put in the financial statements? You mean to be able to get a good estimate? Right, so it's gotta be probable and they have to have a good estimate, right? If they can't give a good estimate, then we expect them to disclose the range, right? Okay, but assuming it is estimable, they should book that, right? Okay, what if it's possible but not probable? It's possible that there will be a loss, but not probable. Maybe you should just disclose that. 
Yeah, if it's probable but not estimable, I mean, uh, uh, possible but not probable, then we would disclose it, right? What if it's remote? You don't have to do anything, right? So we're going to be asking the attorney to talk about specific situations <coughs> where there is a what? Probable, possible, because this will guide us as to what we need to have, make sure it has been properly disclosed in the financial statements, right? Okay, so all of these things, the inquiry of the client, the direct communication between the CPA and the attorney uh, must happen, okay? That has to happen, but mainly this uh, attorney response is the main thing. Now, what happens if management, well, what happens if attorney refuses to respond. What happens if we send the letter to the attorney and the attorney comes back and says, no, I'm not answering those questions? What should we do? We should ask the management to push their client to uh, push the attorney? Well, not like physically, but just like make them, hey, give this answer to the auditor. Okay. Try telling the attorney what to do. Sometimes, <laughs> see how far you get. Go over to the law school over here and tell some attorneys, hey, make me a sandwich. <laughs> see what they say to you. The attorney refuses. The client would say, hey, client, better get the attorney to respond. The client, the attorney doesn't respond. So we do not get a response from the attorney. What should we do? Supposed to be direct communication between the CPA and the attorney, right? So we're supposed to follow a procedure there. What if we can't follow that procedure? We are the CPA. We are the CPA. The CPA is going to talk to the jury. We are the CPA. I mean, isn't that our response to the situation? If we can't get the information we need, we have a scope limitation that requires us to modify the opinion. So we will either qualify our opinion, and again, we're going to study this next time, but we will either qualify our opinion or disclaim, depending on how severely we think that limited our scope. And I think that we're heading toward the qualification because you start to wonder to yourself, why would the attorney not be willing to respond to that? I mean, that's a weird, a little bit of a weird condition. In what? If I'm an attorney and they put, they, I get this letter that says you need to respond, I am not required to put anything in that letter that I think might violate the client attorney privilege, that I think might be unwise to disclose. So for example, let's say there's some discussion back and forth that there's a potential that I have violated a patent. And I ask my attorney to go ahead and respond to that, and the attorney puts in the letter, yes, we think it is probable that we will lose this case related to this patent violation. We start booking a liability for that, et cetera, or we write off or write down the patent. If I'm the other company that's suing for that situation, then I'm going to say, aha, we got them. Let's go for the maximum outcome for this particular case, right? So the client's attorney can limit their responses to a certain level of confidentiality, what may be unwise to have disclosed. So if I'm an attorney, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, well, I'm not going to 
put anything in the letter that I don't want to. So I would just sit there and I would respond to that letter, keeping myself clear of any what potential bias of my cases that are out there, etc. So if the attorney refuses to respond, I'm starting to think, well, maybe they murdered somebody or something. You know, I don't understand why an attorney would do that. So any attorney worth their salt that really wasn't trying to hide something would go ahead and disclose that, right? Okay, go ahead and respond to that letter, I should say. Okay. Now, what happens if the client client refuses to let you contact the attorney. What happens if the client refuses to let you even contact the attorney? You say, hey, we have to contact the attorney. It's one of our required procedures. The client says, oh, nope. Nope. We have an attorney out there that we've been working with, but we go, you can't talk to him. You can't send him a letter. We're not going to print the letter and let you talk to them. Right. We are absolutely at that point going to disclaim an opinion. That scope limitation is considered more severe than the attorney not responding because now the client is sitting there and they're barring us. They're refusing to let us perform a procedure, right? So we are going to absolutely disclaim an opinion. And you're right, Michael. We may even want to at that point, what? Withdraw from the engagement. Okay. This is why in the engagement letter, the letter that comes at the very beginning of the audit, we say what? You will arrange for communication with our attorney, with your attorney, etc. So if we get to the point where we're actually doing that procedure, which is coming at the end of the engagement, isn't it? We're actually doing that and going to do that procedure, and the client won't let us do that procedure, then we're going to say, okay, we're withdrawing from the engagement, and here's the bill for the fees that we've completed up to this point. And if they sit there and they say, well, we're not paying you because you didn't complete the audit when we hold up the engagement letter, say, remember, you signed this and you said that you would allow us to speak to the attorney. We don't want to wait till the end. We're going to go broke that way. We've done all the work. Now we don't need your opinion. We can't collect our fee. That's a good way to go bankrupt pretty quickly in this business, right? Okay. Okay, good. So this is the process. This is the letter. You can't really see it, but it'll say, you know, there's been these different uh, cases and what is the out uh, potential for an unfavorable outcome, et cetera, right? All that sort of stuff. Uh-huh. So the client who collects your fees, are they the attorney who is working the information, right? Yes, it's on the client's letterhead. But the auditor really prepares the um, the letter, gives it to management, says, okay, take a look at this, okay, then the management hands it back to the auditor. Auditor sends it directly to the attorney. The attorney responds directly to the auditor. But the client has to look at the The letter comes from the um, the letter comes from the client to the attorney, but the auditor sends it and controls it. But the client can say what could we use now to no. be displayed. No. It has to come from the uh, from the client because the attorneys don't want to get in this business of responding to me about your case. So I'm the auditor. I go ahead and I say, here's the letter. And I say, look at that letter and please sign that letter that you're going, that you want the attorney to, to respond to. So you go ahead, you sign that letter. Oh, sorry. Okay, so you sign that letter, right? Then you turn around, you hand the letter back to me. I take the letter. 
Okay, that's what I want in that letter. I send it to Michael, the attorney. Michael fills out the letter as the attorney as to the outcome of the different cases and whatnot. Sends the letter back to me. So he is responding to your request because they can't they don't want to be talking to me about your case, but I am what controlling the mailing of that letter, right? So that it comes back directly to me. So the letter is from the client to the attorney, but I control the letter, right? So I, I still got it, but so still the attorney, the client is controlled with the attorney is only no, the attorney will provide their responses. They don't just sign it. I mean, they're going to respond, but they're not going to. They're going to only bring what the client wanted. No, the client will say in there. If you look at the letter, it's kind of. I mean, it's the form letter. It's what we're saying. In connection with the audit, our financial statements of December thirty first for the year then ended. Management of Bluth Company has prepared and furnished to Michael. Uh, scam, uh, which is um, a description evaluation of certain contingencies, including those set forth below, blah, blah, blah. So this is the letter coming in. Please furnish to our auditors such explanation of any. And so they would go ahead and put the, we would put the case that's in there, whatever the case is, and then Please furnish to our auditors such explanation of any you consider necessary to supplement the foregoing information. So the attorney can put <coughs> things in there that would add to that. Okay, so, you know, management, again, is the one, because we say inquire of management. I mean, they should inquire of clients. I mean, they know what cases they're exposed to, right? And so and we would be checking that to make sure that, um, Checking that to make sure that we didn't find something else in the uh, minutes of the board meetings, that sort of thing. So we're doing some due diligence around that. But we're expecting management to go ahead and put down the cases, that sort of thing. And then we're expecting the attorney to weigh in on those cases and what they think. But we control the letter so that it has the things that we think should be in there, et cetera, that it's written in a way that it's supposed to for our purposes. We control the letter, we send it, they send it back to us. Okay? Now, you know, when I talk about this in my classes, I start getting this sense that the students are like, well, what use is that process? And my answer is, I agree with you. I mean, this is not on the high level of audit evidence, in my opinion, you know, okay? I mean, this is the attorney doesn't have to put stuff in there that they don't want to, you know, they don't want to respond to it, okay? But it gives us some prayer. This is a prayer to please, you know, client put everything down there and please attorney do a good job of responding to it, right? Okay? Now, so if you look at this, inquiry of the client Okay, and we're going to talk about the management representation letter here in a little while. And in the management rep letter, management's going to say, we've told you about all litigation claim and assessment, and they sign off on that. So we're really relying on the written testimony of management in this area, aren't we? Okay, and that to me adds a much more, uh, gives us a much more reliable set of evidence because under certain laws, Sarbanes-Oxley, et cetera. Management is not to intentionally withhold information to the financial system that told us they told us everything, and then it turns out that there's something that should have been disclosed that was not. That's putting management much more on the hook than we are, right? Okay, so we're doing this procedure. I'm not sure that it's exactly, you know, the high level of evidence that it might imply that it is. Okay? But we have to do this. This required procedure. Okay, and you can see this is pretty much what I talked about. This is my summary slide. Okay, written representations. Okay, so we say that the written representation, we call this a management rep letter. 
management representation letter provided by management to the auditor. Okay, now, how does that work? We ask the client again for their letterhead. And we print what has to go into that letter on their letterhead. We hand it to them. They probably have their counsel, whatever, look at it. They then do what? Sign it, hand it back to us. So even though it sounds like, okay, management's writing this letter to the auditor, actually the auditor is saying what needs to go in the letter and then sitting there and getting it back for management to sign, okay? Now, sometimes I was on an audit of the House of Representatives Child Care Center. Why does the House of Representatives have to have its own child care center? Because their children can't be mixing with other children, right? They, they, you didn't have to be a, a member of the House of Representatives. You could have to be an employee of the House of Representatives. But they had their own child care center. And in those days, in order to get your license in the state of California, you had to plan, perform, and report on an audit entirely on your own. So uh, what GAO did is to help uh, people like myself get a license, they selected an entity that was small enough that one person could bring us do all the work on it. So I got the House Representative Child Care Center, and I get to the stage where I give them the manager rep letter, and they're starting to refuse to sign it. And I'm like, well, why are you refusing? Well, do you want us to sign it alone? We don't. And they were a less sophisticated entity, and I had to explain to them, well, you have to do this because this letter is mandatory. If you don't sign this letter, we are going to have to disclaim an opinion on the financial statements or withdraw from the engagement. And we couldn't withdraw from the engagement because it was legislatively mandated that we would do the engagement. So we were going to have to complete the engagement regardless, but we would have to disclose an opinion on the financial statements if they didn't sign it. So sometimes you'll have a, um, a client that you know, basically doesn't understand what's going on. You have to kind of talk them off the ledge, okay? So let's take a look at uh, some information here that I took from uh, another set of information outside of the textbook to get a little bit more. Uh, final piece of aud audit evidence. It is what? It is mandatory, okay, in order to give an unmodified opinion. So if you don't get the letter, I think I misspoke, you will either have to uh, qualify or disclaim, okay, but you cannot give an unqualified opinion if they do not allow you to uh, get this uh, piece of evidence, okay. Management refusal will usually result in what? Disclaimer or withdrawal, just like we said, if they won't let us uh, talk to the attorney. Okay, now it is dated the same date as the audit report. That means it really is the final piece of audit evidence that we're going to get. Okay, it is signed at the highest levels of the organization. It's the CFO, CEO that's signing. You don't go to you know the janitor and say, "Hey, can you sign the management rep letter here?" Okay. Now you come over, unless the manager is the CEO, uh, the janitor is the CEO or CFO, if that's the case, then I guess it would be okay for the manager, the janitor to do it. Okay, now, there are some obligatory things in here, you know, they are responsible for the financial statements, they are responsible for the internal control, yon yon, we've been telling them that since the very beginning of the engagement, haven't we? Okay, now when you start getting down here though into some of these things, okay, these things the way I like to try to remember would it be appropriate or would it be necessary to include it in the, um, the management rep letter? These things down here are things that are hard to audit. But what does that mean? Completeness of information. Completeness is the scary assertion, isn't it? Because what? You just have the little financial statements here, and you're worried that the whole world that could possibly have to be in here isn't in here. That's scary, isn't it? So what do we do? Since it's hard to audit the complete existence, it's a much easier assertion. Let's see. They put something down here. Let me go see if there's evidence of it. 
Consistence is the peak to cake assertion. Completeness is the scary one because what? There might be something missing. And there's a whole world out there, right? So what do we do? We have them put in the management rep letter that's going to be signed last day of field work. La what do they used to call it? Last day of field work. Date of our report. Last day of work. Last day that we do the work. And we'll just say that we obtained the sufficient audit evidence. They're going to sign that and date it that day. And they'll say, we gave you everything. So if something's missing, it's not all on us. We're like, well, they said they gave us everything. And then they did Okay? Fraud is hard to audit, isn't it? Because there's the concealment aspects. So we make them put in the management rep letter if they had knowledge of fraud, etc. They told us about it, right? Okay. What else? Violation of laws is a difficult thing to audit. And so we're going to have an expectation. We're still under the hard to audit. I'm not going to write it again. We're still under the hard to audit list now. If they violated laws and whatnot, that may be difficult for us to determine because what? We're not involved in the day-to-day -day management of this entity. They should know what laws are relevant to their operation, right? And should be able to tell us if they violated such, right? Okay. Litigation claim and assessments. Here we go. Just in case that prayer didn't work out, just in case the attorney didn't put the things down that we expected, management didn't put the things that we wanted, we cover ourselves again in this management rep letter to cover ourselves that way, right? Okay. Related party transactions. Who do we find out who the related parties are again? They tell us, don't they? So, you know, just in case they thought we were joking about telling us who the related parties are so we can determine the related parties have been properly disclosed, we make them put it down in the management rep letter. We're going to talk about subsequent events. Subsequent events are a scary thing because what? We're kind of towards the end of the audit. We're not doing much more detailed work. And some things could be happening subsequent to the um, year end that need to be disclosed. That gets a little squishier, doesn't it? So we say, hey, you told us about all those other good events, right? CEO, CFO that's going to sign this letter. Okay, so it's really a what? CYA step that comes at the end of the engagement. You know what CYA is? Thank you. Say that again. I'll cover your ass. That's right. Okay, so it's the cover your you know what step. Okay, estimates are hard to audit. Did they make the correct estimates? Did they use all the right information, et cetera, right? So all of these things, when you really look at this letter, end up being what? Hard to audit thing? Okay. Okay, good. Ability to continue as a going concern. We are required to see if we see evidence of going concern problems. Okay, for example, Let's say that we see losses, period after period. Are you concerned about going concerned? Yes. Yes, you are. And so you would need to look at that at that point in time to see if you see uh, potential uh, problems with going concerned. Okay? Now, if you do, you will look for... mitigating factors. Okay, you'll look for mitigating factors. For example, mitigating means make your concern go away. Mitigating factors means the factors that will make your concern go away. So let's say you're showing losses period after period. And management says, well, we can borrow some money that will help us cover those problems might be a mitigating factor, right? We're going to issue more stock. And that will get us some money in so that we can cover this loss that's happening period after period. We'll get some cash in that way, right? Okay, we'll cover ourselves that way. Now, is it very likely that an entity that's showing losses period after period is going to be able to borrow money? Okay, so it is possible that an entity that's losing money period after period is going to be able to issue some more stock. Okay, so it's not only what that they have the root mitigating factors, but they must also have the ability to what? 
carry those out. So you can't just sit there and look to see, uh, okay, they tell us what their mitigating plans are, and then you sit there and you do what? You say, oh, okay, well, since you said you're going to do that, then that takes away the problem. So they have to have the ability to carry those out. I should probably put ability here. Now, what happens if you look at the mitigating factors and um, you look at their plans and they have the ability to carry them out and it alleviates your concern? If it alleviates your concern, then you do not have to do anything further. That's it. There is no effect on your report on the financial statements for what you saw as potential problems. Yes, they have losses period after period, but those losses are being caused by research and development expenses. Under FASB, we have to, um, we have to expense all research and development under U.S. GAAP. IFRS says that you can expense, you have to expense the uh, research just like U.S. GAAP but you can capitalize the development, okay? But U.S. GAAP says expense, research, and development. And your Tesla, are we as concerned about that loss, that that loss is being driven primarily by what? An accounting requirement that says that they expense all research and development, or meanwhile, we're thinking, you know, Elon Musk is gonna create a chip that you can put in and we'll all become ninjas. Okay, so maybe we're sitting there and saying, okay, that expense that's causing that loss is something that we think they'll be able to issue more stock to get over to continue their research and eventually we'll see profitability in the company, which is pretty much what happened with Tesla, right? Okay, they're, they're showing losses. Now they're starting, starting to show some amount of profitability, right? Okay, if the concerns remain, you look at that loss period after period and you know you get to a stage where you're like you know they are not going to be able to carry out these mitigating factors then you will be required to put in your report a going concern warning that we're going to talk about how that would look next time but literally in your report you'll put a paragraph in and it says there is substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. You have to have those two phrases in there, substantial doubt and going concern. And it calls it out so that users of the financial statements can look. And you may not, you may believe that financial statements are fairly stated, but that is significant enough that it'll go in our report and we'll warn the users that there's substantial doubt about the energy's ability to continue as going concern. Okay. Question? I was on the audit of the consolidated financial statements of the federal government. And somebody in GAO, who ultimately got fired, high level person, was finally asked for reasons. He was always coming up with weird ideas like this, and he wanted to be a player in DC politics. Not national politics, but local politics is what he wanted. So he was looking for platforms to stand on and stuff. And finally, GEO, the Comptroller General, got tired of that and he asked him to end the designation. You know, they have these executive level people that can be asked to end their designation at any point in time. They're federal employees, but they're different than, uh, you know, sort of a, what do you call it, rank and file. Federal employee, which in order to fire a rank and file federal employee, the employee has to commit murder in order to be fired. Okay, so anyway, so what happened? Um, this guy ultimately was asked to resign. He wanted to put a going concern paragraph in the report of the consolidated financial statements of the federal government. And, you know, everyone in GAO was like, I think you might want to step away from that idea. Now, he was looking at it from the standpoint of, what well, losses, period after period, budget constraints, this sort of thing. Let's put the going concern paragraph in there. And theoretically, I guess he had a point, but what? Politically, there was no way on earth that was going to happen. 
Okay? Now, somehow, I don't know how the hell I got on that assignment of looking at what were the factors that were going to lead to this going to concern paragraph. I guess I must have pissed somebody off at some point. So I'm, I'm like, this is stupid. I don't want to be on this assignment. This is dumb. Okay? I mean, what are we going to put as the, uh, let, let's look at a mitigating factor. It's the biggest, baddest country the world has ever known. If we go bankrupt, what will we do? We will come and take your shit from you in order to survive. Okay, so, you know, there's no going concern issue. If we have to, we'll blow up the whole world to continue the going concern. I mean, isn't that pretty much the posture of the United States? I mean, it's a little bit ridiculous to sit there and say that there's a going concern of the, for the United States. So, and I'll stop. This is the way I talk in cadence. So. <laughs> okay, so what happened? You sit there, and it was this was a dumb assignment. So I begged somebody else to draft me off of their assignment, off of that assignment to there. So the person I said, "Well, we need John because John is going to teach college." Oh, okay, and I got off of it, and then that assignment went all the way down to the bottom of the ship. Everybody that was on that assignment ended up, you know, having to scramble to get on different things. Stuff like that later. So if you ever find yourself in a funky assignment, that's when you start talking to people while you're in the bathroom. Hey, can you get me off of this thing? Okay, and uh, they might help you out. Okay, but uh, if you're not in a situation where you're the biggest, baddest country there's ever been and whatnot, and you can't mitigate, then yes, there would be the going concern paragraph, right? GM got one. Okay, GM got a going concern issue in there when they were what? When they were having their financial difficulty. Now, were they able to raise capital to get out of it? How did they raise capital? Didn't the government? Yeah, the government essentially bought GM stock, right, to get an infusion of their money. Now, I'm not sure how that played out. I was following it for a while. I'm not sure if the government has now uh, sold off that stock at a gain or, or what. It's, uh, I'm not sure how that. That was all part of the Troubled Asset Relief Program. They rolled all that in. But uh, GM is still here. So, But they did get that going concern paragraph at one time. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Adjusting entries. Okay. Um, we are going to want to make sure that if there are material misstatements, that there be adjustments for those, okay? If there were unrecorded, uh, uncorrected misstatements, I should say, for previous audits, um, for this audit, we'll consider in the future. If there were some corrected from previous audits, we'd want to make sure that um, those are covered, um, though, that those don't affect the current year statements. We are to communicate all adjustments and misstatements to audit committees, uh, those charged with governance. Okay, audit committees, sometimes they don't call it an audit committee, they might call it a board of commissioners or something. We have to communicate all of these. Everything goes up, well, those that are material, okay, if it's, if it's inconsequential, we don't have to report those. But we would report those material misstatements that were corrected to management at those charges of government. Now, why do we report those that are corrected? Obviously, those that are uncorrected, if they're material, they're going to affect the audit reports of those charges of government because they don't buy okay, they read the audit report. But if there's a correction, they don't want to affect our audit report, right? But why do we want to report that to management and those charges of government? Audit committees, those charges of government is a synonymous term. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to report? You found a material misstatement. They corrected it. Management said, you're right, auditors, let's correct that. We issue an unmodified opinion. We say no problem with these financial statements. Yet the standard is telling us you still have to go and communicate that to audit committee, aka those charged with governance. I'm making so that they don't want to keep that mistake. Okay, it is a prayer that the what corporate governance structure will work and the audit committee those charged with governance will say okay thank you for telling us about that auditor 
what happened? Why was there necessity for that adjustment? What led to that problem? What are we doing to correct that, etc.? And we're expecting that corporate governance structure to take take hold, right? Otherwise, what? They get an unmodified opinion. We don't tell them anything that went wrong. They think, geez, you know, our management and they're doing our senior management doing a great job. The financial statements are being issued with no problems, right? Meanwhile, we went through hellfire to get that unqualified opinion. So yes, we are trying to uh, help the corporate governance structure. Remember when we talked about internal control, the top part was the control environment. Control environment touched everything else, didn't it? In tr control environment included involvement of the audit committee and those charge of governance. So we're making sure they're on in the loop, right? Okay, so everything goes up. Everything goes up, except inconsequential in the chair. We don't burden them with, well, we found a $5 error. Those things that are consequential need to go up. Okay. Okay, good. Supervised. Okay. There will be a reviewing partner. And the reviewing partner will look to see that we have what? The proper quality. I'm not trying to strike out quality. I'm trying to highlight it. The proper quality. Let's try that one more time. The proper quality. Okay. So, um, have we followed standards? So, reviewing partner is someone that was previously unrelated to the audit. So, the reviewing partner is not the partner that managed the day to day of that audit. This is someone who had no, um, no past involvement with the engagement, now comes back through and does a review of the work, right? Okay. Um, in GAO, we had a quality control procedure, which is one of the few that I really believed in. Sometimes the reviewing is like, okay, really, did this person understand what the heck we're doing? Did the review that came from higher levels and different parts of the other organization sometimes they're annoying. The one quality control procedure that I, I should say the one, the one that I firmly believed in was another auditor would come back in and check every fact, figure, date, conclusion, statement that we made in those reports. We call that referencing. It is often a painful process because what happens? You sit there and you're involved in the day to day and you know certain things work a certain way, right? And you put that in the report, but then you don't have the appropriate documentation in the work paper to cover that. Now you've got to go back and take, get some additional evidence that will support a comment that you didn't properly document in the work paper. But it creates a beautiful tie between what's in the work papers and what you ultimately put in your report. Now what I thought was interesting was one time, the way GAO is structured, there's not a lot of CPAs. And in a different area, not the assurance area, Somebody had put some comments in there about accounting standards and what the accounting standards say about a certain subject. And I guess they hadn't documented it the way they were asked to, uh, the way they should have. And so the referencer said, uh, you need to go talk to John Lord about this to see if this is okay in here. So this person comes in and they say, Will you read this and see if this is okay? And I'm like, well, I, yeah, it looks okay. Let me check the standard. He said, no, 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 you don't have to check the standard. The person said that if you said it was okay, then it's okay. You know, so I was like, they don't accept that one. I'm being referenced. I'm being referenced. They want the documentation. Here, put this in the work paper so it's covered. So, um, you know, something like that has to happen, though. Okay. Okay, good. Subsequent events and subsequently discovered facts. Okay, let's talk about each of these on the next slide. Let's start with subsequent events. Okay, subsequent events. And there are two types of subsequent events. There are subsequent events that are recognized and There are subsequent events that are recognized, and there are subsequent events that are non-recognized. Okay, 
Now, subsequent events that are recognized are those that occurs, the subsequent event occurs after the balance sheet date. I hate these highlighters and these. Subsequent event occurs. God. Subsequent event occurs after the balance sheet date, but before the financial statements are issued. Now, when we have subsequent events that are recognized, entities must recognize the effect of all recognized subsequent events, you think, in the financial statements um, if the conditions existed at the balance sheet date. For example, settlement of a litigation. Okay, so what happens? There was a lawsuit that was in place towards the end of the year. We had already been sued, and we find out that the client loses the case after the balance sheet date, but what? Before the financial statements were issued. Okay? Now, the conditions that gave rise to that subsequent event, they finally lost the lawsuit after the balance sheet date, before the financial statements were issued. The events that gave rise to that subsequent event were what? In place at the balance sheet date, weren't they? They had already been sued at, say, maybe that lawsuit had been going on for a couple of years, right? And so they had already been sued, and then the case isn't settled until after the balance sheet date. But the lawsuit was already in place at the balance sheet date, right? That is a recognized subsequent event. What should we do, Pay? make that a little clear. Lawsuit has been going on for a couple years. So just to make it easy, we get sued on February 3rd, year one. The case, we settle. We settle for a law at, this is 1231. We, year one, and we settle for a loss on March at, I'll say, January 17th, thank you, numbers up, year two. Did the conditions that gave rise to that subsequent event, the settlement of the loss, did they exist at 1231? Yeah. Did the circumstances that gave rise to that loss, so we didn't actually know that we were going to lose, we didn't know we were going to settle until January, did the conditions that gave rise to that loss exist at the balance sheet date? Yes, yes it did, because we had already been sued, hadn't we? I mean, if we hadn't, there would be nothing to settle if we hadn't been sued. We were already sued at what? At December 31st, weren't we? So the conditions that gave rise to that did exist at the balance sheet date, so we have to recognize it. So, Pay, what would you expect there to be for our 1231 financial statement? Mm -hmm. cool. loss. Go ahead, give me debit, give me credit. Give me credit. Okay, we would credit liability, contingent liability, whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you want to debit? Huh? Well, we call it an expense unless we were in the business of getting sued. Expenses are normal course of business. Losses are outside the normal course of business. But yeah, we would debit a loss, wouldn't we? The takeaway being what? I might get a touch on the journal issues on your exam. The takeaway being we book that into the financial statement. Don't we accrue for that loss? Okay, why? Because the lawsuit already existed at December 31st, and all that's happened now is before we've issued the financial statements, remember we're not going to issue the financial statements until March or something, but we have better information now, don't we? 
supposed to be happening, what's this probable, what's the range? We know what the loss is, don't we? So we are to book that to the conditions gave rise. The conditions gave rise that subsequent event existed at the balance sheet date, right? Okay, let me give you another question. Let's say that we have a client with a major customer. Okay, major customer that declares bankruptcy in January. They declare bankruptcy January 17th. <clears throat> Did the conditions that gave rise to that subsequent event, because we don't find about it until January, did the conditions that gave rise to that subsequent event exist at the balance sheet date? Good. I'm glad you stepped into that trap. You never <laughs> stepped into it again, especially on your exam. Okay, That would be a recognized subsequent event. The standards specifically call that out. It's something that has to be considered a uh, recognized subsequent event because nobody goes bankrupt overnight. It's not like in December 31st, everything was fine, and then all of a sudden, you know, when January hits and the company is only going to get some go bankrupt, you know, the conditions that gave rise to that were in effect at the balance sheet date, weren't they? Okay, so what would we do in that case? Client major customer goes bankrupt. We don't find out about that. They don't actually declare the bankruptcy until January, but the standards have told us that's a recognized subsequent event, right? What should we do? Maybe you write down the receivable. Good. How do you write down the receivable? Well, before you increase the allowance, write off the receivable. You need to step in Write off the receivable. Good. Debit the allowance. Credit what? Good. Credit the account receivable, right? What's your name again? Pam. Pam? Good, Pam. All right, Pam, if I debit the allowance, is the allowance a balance going to go down? Huh? If you decrease the allowance balance, is there a chance that you'd like to put some back into the allowance? You wrote something off, so the, you, you were satisfied with that allowance balance, right? Now you've had to write it down, so the allowance balance has gone down, hasn't it? So how can you get it to go back up? Huh? Good. Credit the allowance. If I credit the allowance, then what? I got to debit something. Good. I debit the bad debt expense for the additional amount I put in the allowance to cover the amount that I wrote off because of this recognized subsequent event. So this recognized event, subsequent event, spawned what? Two journal entries. Okay. Takeaway is what? If there's something like a bankruptcy that's declared, that's considered a recognized subsequent event. And the other takeaway is what? Recognized subsequent event generate journal entries, don't they? Have to be booked? Okay. Um, I have a student that I am. I don't care, I can't think of these students. I've been making me work with her. Yeah. I'm working with a student, and and the student did a research project, and um, in her research project, she did a case in which there was a company that hadn't paid <coughs> sales tax. And the reason they hadn't paid sales tax is they were, say, a California company. I don't think they were. They were a California company. They were making sales over the internet in other states 
and they didn't appropriately collect the sales tax of the other states when they were uh, having sales. This is a common mistake that startups make. Startups don't think about these things. They don't get involved with the auditors and the accountants until later on, and then all of a sudden someone says, you know, you owe all these sales taxes, right, to all these different uh, states and stuff. So they had, I don't know what it was, something like a 40 million, the case, they had like a 40 million dollars of sales taxes they hadn't properly withheld nor remitted to the different states. And we find this out on December 31st. Is this a recognized event? Should this be recognized? Should they book a liability and a expense for those taxes? So they did. But then, at March, around March, one of the states, they said that they only owed the money to one state in the next one. All the states in which you do business. So I think they were just trying to make the states easier. But anyway, then, in March of the next year, the state said, we'll forgive half. If you pay us half of what you owe, we'll forgive the other half. The state trying to at least get some of the money, right? They passed a law in March of that next year to say that we'll forgive half. And so the company started to apply for that and whatnot, and they finally just paid the half in June of that next year. Now, is this a recognized or, I always forget, what do they call it? Unrecognized, I always say unrecognized. Is this a recognized or unrecognized subsequent event? Now, they booked the tax. They booked the, the tax expense, they booked the liability. That was the debit and credit December 31st. Should they reverse half of that for the event that happened in March? And the answer is, although my student didn't address this, so I told him we should go back and do this to, to address the fact that we have a what? We have an unrecognized subsequent event. Is it what? The new law wasn't passed until after the balance sheet day, right? So that thing that would have taken away the liability didn't happen until what? After the balance sheet day. And at that point, the disclosure with an unrecognized subsequent event, the rule is that what? They have to be. There's no recognition of them, obviously. Well, gosh darn it. Might be nice if this stupid thing said what is supposed to happen with it. A unrecognized subsequent event. Yeah, needs to be disclosed. Needs to be disclosed. So even though there won't be a journal entry, there'll be a footnote discussion, right? And so I wanted my students to put in there, hey, that needs to be disclosed, right? In the, in the sort of research paper, that there has to be some disclosure on that. Loss of plant inventory due to fire. What happens here? The plant blows up on January 17th. Now, unless there was a ticking time bomb there at December 31st, okay, we would assume that to be an unrecognized subsequent event, meaning they don't have to debit loss and credit plants to take it off the books, but they do have to disclose that after the balance sheet date, you see that plant that's listed there in the financial statements? There's now a hole in the ground. Whatever, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, how will you identify these subsequent events? Okay. And the best way is to inquire of management. Expect them to tell you about those. We put subsequent events in the management rep letter, didn't we? Remember that was one of the things in the management rep letter? Okay. Then what? Do a post balance sheet. Oops, sorry, guys. Do a post balance sheet transaction review. All of a sudden, you start seeing all of these uh, correspondence with attorneys. 
you start seeing, um, you know, a big check being written for some sort of settlement on a lawsuit, etc. You might ask, what's this for? Oh, we settled a lawsuit. Oh, really? Was that lawsuit in place at the beginning of the year? <laughs> Whatever, right? Representation letter. We make them put that in the rep letter. Okay. Now, what happens if you're finished your audit work, you date your audit report February 5th. On February 13th, a couple of days before you're going to issue financial statements, you get a call and they say, you know what, we had a problem with the plant blew up and it's happened now before we issue the financial statement, so it's falling in the subsequent period, and we want to disclose that. So they ask you to come and take a look at their disclosures that are related to that plant blowing up. And let's say you erase February 5th as the date of your audit report, because they're saying the plant blew up on February 13th, and you date your audit report February 13th. You have now not only accepted responsibility for that plant that blew up on February 13th and you're satisfied with the disclosures, but anything else that might have happened between February 5th and February 13th, of which case you haven't done the subsequent event review for other things that might have happened during that same period of time. You've opened yourself up to any other subsequent event that happened between February 5th and February 15th. 13th. Now, you want to issue the financial statements, though, on the 15th. So you don't have a lot of time to be going and, you know, reading minutes and doing a post-transaction. There's no time for that. Is there something you can do? And the answer is here. You will dual date the auditor's report. You'll revise to reflect the new information. Um, and you can dual date your report. So in that example, and now I don't know if I, I hope I can remember the days that I used in this example, you will say the date of our report is, what day did I say it was before? The date of your report is February 3rd. Except footnote 72, date of the report is February what? I said February 13th. No, that's right, 15th. February, huh? February 15th. February 13th is the date for footnote 72. You put two dates on the report so that you fix your responsibility to what? To that footnote for that later date, but not for the rest of the audit report, right? That's called dual dating. I know you've got dual dating when your friend says you owe somebody to be in bank or on a dual date. That's not dual dating. Okay, that's double dating. This is dual dating. Okay. Okay. Now, what happens if you've issued the um, auto report? and something comes to your attention. So there was some event out there that should have been included in the financial statements. God damn. There's something out there that should have been included in the financial statements but was not, and you find out about that after the financial statements have been issued. Are you happy? You're not happy. You're like, okay, we kind of missed the boat here. So you are to notify individuals that are relying on the financial statements and ask management to do what? Revise and reissue the financial statements to include that known information now. Okay, do you want this to happen? This is very bad if this happens, right? Okay, but if it does, you have responsibility to notify individuals relying on the financial statements and issue revised information. Okay, all right, I'm thinking if we're going to take a break, we better take it now. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and what, do like maybe 10 minutes? And uh, we'll go ahead and pick up from uh, this slide here. And then we'll do the quiz and the homework. Oh, I, I put them all in one in the quiz now. So it's 20 questions in the quiz. We'll do the quiz and then we'll get out of here, okay? But let's go ahead and let's take a quick break. Resume the recording. And we've got a few more slides to go here. And then we'll, as I said, take a look at the uh, quiz um, questions. There's 20 quiz questions. I'm For the last few chapters here, I'm not going to uh, put homework questions up. I'll put the full set of homework questions so you can see all those. But in terms of what I've selected out for you, I'll just do the quizzes. I'll just take the quiz questions since those are more like your uh, exams. Okay? Okay, subsequent discovered facts, we've actually already kind of talked about that. Something happens, what, after the report release date, we're going to notify those relying on financial statements, estimated that you revise, right? Okay, omitted <coughs> procedures. What happens if we've forgotten to do a procedure? Not something we want to happen very much, right? Okay, we have already talked about things that need to be communicated with those charged with governance. We'll talk about uh, some of the specific requirements under that though and then management letters this is not a management rep letter this is a management rep uh, management letter it's from the auditor to management as opposed to management rep letter is from what from management to the auditor okay so we'll talk about that a little bit okay all right so we come over and <coughs> omitted audit procedures we already talked about uh, subsequently discovered facts what we're supposed to do so let's talk about omitted audit procedure. Let's say we were, are we required by uh, auditing standards to confirm accounts receivable? We're required to, unless there was some extenuating circumstance, in which case we would perform uh, alternative procedures, right? Okay, now let's say we're having that file review. Now, that uh, auditor review, that partner review, which actually should happen before the financial statements are issued. But let's say the financial statements are issued and there's some sort of peer review or something that's done and they say, hey, did you confirm accounts receivable? Stephanie, did you confirm accounts receivable? Okay, it's a good thing to say okay. if there's a procedure and someone's looked at your work papers and someone comes in and says, you do it? You say, I thought you did. So you put it right there. <laughs> okay. All right. So you sit there, and we find out that we did confirm accounts too, and we were supposed to, right? Now, we want to do that to help us with the existence assertion on accounts receivable, right? So it's now, I don't know, February, and we want to confirm accounts receivable that are outstanding on December 31st. What's the chances that we're going to be able to perform that audit procedure at this point? We want to perform the procedure. Well, first, we look to make sure that individuals are relying on the financial statements. No one relying on the financial statements. Who cares, right? But presumably, we audited them so people can rely on them, right? So chances that that's the case. Well, we go ahead and we want to try to now apply the procedure that we omitted, right? Is it likely that you could confirm accounts receivable with the balance was of December 31st of February? Your clients, you know, customers are going to say, look, we don't sit here and maintain our records to tell you what we owed individuals in days gone by. You know, if you want to know what they owe us today, we can tell you that. If you'd asked us at December 31st what they owed us, we might have told you that. But, you know, we're not going to sit here and hold all this information, data in our accounting system. Any other dates you're interested in? How about February 15th of last year? You know, so they're not very likely to have that date for us, right? So now we're saying, okay, we weren't able to apply the procedure, so we apply an alternative procedure. So now we look to see if they collected on the receivable. If they collected on that receivable, we're covered, right? Even though we didn't confirm account receivable, there was another procedure that we were able to perform after the date of the financial statements that covered us, right? Now what happens if we look to see if they collected on that receivable after the year end, 
and we find out that there were some items that they listed as account receivable that should have been written off. They weren't able to collect whatever. Now what do we do? We call our malpractice attorney. They say, we think we've got a problem. We were supposed to do a procedure. We did not. And we do what? Notify those known to be relying on the financial statements of this. Now we're into the subsequent discovered fact, aren't we? Ask management to revise the information to fix it. But we're not too happy. Now it's not something just happened that nobody told us about. Now it's we made a mistake, isn't it? Okay. So are individuals relying okay on the omitted R procedure? Is it important? I mean, if it's not important and someone asks us, well, why didn't you do this procedure? My answer to them would be what? Because it's not important, okay? So obviously, if we're even considering it, it's a important procedure, right? We could apply an alternative procedure and then what? First, we see if individuals are relying on the financial statements. So apply an alternative procedure. If previous opinion can't be, can be supported, no further action is necessary. So if we do the alternative procedure or we perform the procedure that we omitted, although I'm just telling you, in the case of confirmation account receivable, that would be pretty difficult, right? But if, if you can perform the procedure, do so. If you can't perform an alternative procedure, if you look and they collect it, we're done, right? If you look in the example and they should have written something off that they did not, now we have the problem. Now we have to what? Withdraw the original report, issue a revised report, and inform those relying, which is the same thing we said substantially for what? For a subsequently discovered fact. Okay. Communications of those charged with governance, guys. They find out about everything. Problems with the internal control, adjustments that were made to the financial statements. If management communicated with other auditors, other accountants, and we become aware of that, we need to communicate that to those charged with governance because any uh, interaction with other auditors has to be approved by the audit committee in the public company, doesn't it? So we're going to make sure that they are aware of all of those things. Disagreements with management. All of these kinds of things. What did we request from management? Judgments about the quality of accounting estimates. Long list, right? They find out about everything. Everything goes up. Does everything come down? Are there things that we discuss? Does everything that we discuss with those charged with governance have to be communicated back down to management? Let's say you think you have some sort of weakness in competency with management, right? Do you want to discuss that with those charged with governance, right? Because you're talking about estimates that they made, and you're like, eh, I'm not really getting what they're supposed to do with the estimates. Are you then supposed to go to the CFO and say, by the way, we just told your boss that it's really cut in? That's between the what? Between the board of directors and senior management at that point, right? So everything goes up, not everything comes down, right? Okay. All right, good. Management letters, not required. So this is not a management rep letter. Management rep letter is required. Management rep letter comes from the client to the CPA, right? Even though I'm kind of making sure everything that's in there is hard to audit stuff, okay? Management letter is from the CPA to management, okay? And in there, we'll put items that are not necessarily uh, are immaterial, frankly, weaknesses in the internal control that warrant management's attention. So we'll say, look, you know, you've got this little bit of a problem. You should have a better separation of duty when it comes to some issue related to office supplies. I don't know, probably now under exaggerating the reason you would write a management rep letter. I mean, excuse me, a management letter, because you're probably not going to get office supplies. But something that you think is what is important that it warrants their attention, but 
is not significant enough that you have to include in your internal control report, et cetera. So it's sort of an internal communication. The rest of the world doesn't see it between what? Between the auditor and management, right? Now, do you think you have to be careful with this? <laughs> no, sorry. I was in hostile audit engagements my whole career. They had no choice but to have us there. One time, there was this guy, Joe Baez, I later got him to contribute money to the Hispanic CPA. Joe Baez is a good guy. Okay, so I request information from Joe. And Joe says, okay, John, I'm going to get you that information. But don't tell Washington I gave it to you, he said. I said, Joe, you have to give it to me. What do you mean, don't tell Washington he gave it to me? You have to give it to me. But Joe wanted to make sure I felt indebted to him. Right? <laughs> okay, so don't worry about offending management if you're GAO. Okay? Because your Congress there can give us this, right? Okay, but if you're having to maybe, you know, uh, keep that client relationship, you may not want to offend them, but this letter is helping them, isn't it? It's just between you and them saying, hey, you may want to be aware of these, this warrants your attention. So they're probably not going to trip too heavily that you gave this to them, but why do you have to be careful with this? And you're advising the client at the same time you're auditing them. It's all right, you're advising them the things, you know, that they should fix to potentially improve their finance reporting, right? What's wrong with that? You've got to be careful that you don't start having internal communications about things that could potentially, what, blow up into something bigger. Then it's going to be all about, well, why didn't you put that in your internal control report? Why did you try to backdoor it to management? through this communication between the auditor and manager, right? And maybe it looks like you tried to sweep something under the rug. And GAO actually had a problem with that. They wrote in a management letter on an assignment that uh, the, 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 I think it was the Senate, I don't know if it was the Senate or the House Representatives, maybe the Senate, I forget. They had their own bank. They had their own bank only, or maybe it was their own credit union, I forget which. And what they were doing was bouncing checks. The senators, the House members, whatever, were bouncing checks, right? And so GAO wanted to have something done about that, but they got scared that they started calling out that House members, Senate members, whatever it was, were bouncing checks. That all of a sudden, you know, the appropriation committees for the Senate and the House might look at GAO less, a little less favorable. And I started calling out the representative, the gentleman from Hawaii has bounced some checks. You might not be too happy, right? So maybe that would could affect you. So the way they tried to handle it was by issuing a management letter. And then somebody found out that what? these checks were being bounced and all of a sudden GAO wasn't looking too good because, well, why did you write a management letter about this, but you didn't include it in the full report that talked about the financial statements of the Senate Bank House Representative Bank, I forget what this really was. It's either the Senate or the House Bank. So you've got to be careful with these management letters that you don't start thinking of it a way of, you know, <laughs> fix this. It's got to be truly what something that you think is not significant enough to bubble up into your audit report in that, but does warrant management's attention. So it's a little tricky, right? Okay. Okay. Let's look at the quiz.
chapter 11, right? Homework and quiz, I just put them together. Okay, so let's look at some of these. Uh, which of the following events or activities may occur following the audit report release date? Interim testing is what? Before the year end date of the financial statements. Roll forward does what? Goes from the date of my interim testing to year end, doesn't it? Okay. Subsequent events happen what? after the year end, but before the report release date, right? So I look to see which of those should be recognized or non-recognized, okay? Subsequent discovery of facts, yeah, I've released the report, now I've discovered a fact after this report has been released, now I'm asking for what? A revision of the financial statements and I'm notifying those known to be relying on the financial statements, but the financial statements have been released at that point, right? Stop me if there's a question, guys. Number two, interim testing normally occurs between the blank and the blank, beginning of the year under audit and the date of the financial statements, right? So it's going to happen like September 30th, whatever. Beginning of the year is January. We do the interim testing at September 30th, right? So that is, I mean, yeah, September 30th. So that's something that is done, what? After the beginning of the year up to the date of financial statements, right? If I do the testing on 1231, then that's not interim testing anymore, right? Or if I do the audit procedure after 1231, that's not interim. Right? Roll forward work normally occurs between the date of the interim work and the date of the auditor's report, right? We'll roll that forward. Number four, an important method used by auditors to learn of material contingencies is getting that Response for the attorney letter. Okay. I don't know. I don't understand why B wouldn't be a good answer. Inquiring and discussing. What happens if I click on that? Oh, okay. I'm, I'll, I would be wrong. <laughs> I see. Okay. So, uh, inquiring and discussing with management. I don't see why that's not an important method. Examine documents in the client's possession. So, I guess this thing is saying the what? The best, the best method is the response to the attorney letter. I mean, we've talked about inquiring, right? And you could see documents like correspondence from the IRS or something like that, so confirming accounts receivable is definitely wrong. I don't like that question. Which of the following procedures is not used in auditor's examination of litigation claim and assent, uh, 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 assessments? Performing analytical procedure is testing the reasonableness of the financial statements or using it as a substantive test. Okay. But these others obtain description, evaluation, litigation, claim, and assessment from management. Yeah, right? So if that's the case, McGraw-Hill, that's the case, Mr. Lowers, or whatever the name of this author of the book is, then why wouldn't inquiring and discussing with management be a way? They must be saying the best way, I guess, here. But they should have said the best way, right? Because it says in this next one, 
obtaining a description evaluation litigation claim and assessment. That's an inquiry, isn't it? Okay, examining documentary evidence. This question is completely arguing with the last one, isn't it? Reading minutes and meetings of stockholders director, we saw that, right? Remember I said you might saw to see stuff about the lawsuit. Okay, so this is a much better question here. That other one I don't like. The other one, you would do those things. And it should, if it's someone wanted to say which of these is the most reliable or involves external evidence rather than internal evidence, then I would say yes to that other one. But you would do these other things. Which party should request uh, a letter regarding litigation claim and assessment? Who requests the letter? The client requests the letter. The auditor controls and mails it, though, right? To whom should written representations be addressed? It comes from management to the auditor, right? Even though the auditor writes the letter, puts it on the client's letterhead, says, look at this, sign it, and give it back to me, right? If auditors are appointed on January 3rd, 2017, and the date of the financial statements is December 31st, 27, um, 2017, the date of the auditor's report okay, is February 7th, 2018, and the auditor release date is March 3rd, what is the appropriate date of written representations? Okay, that was a long way to get there. The written representation is dated the same date as the auditor's report, right? The representation letter dated the date of the audit report because that's the date that you supposedly completed your audit work, right? And so you, you wait up to that date. So they can't say, oh, well, we didn't include that other thing because your date was, you know, February 2nd and that didn't happen until the 5th, so we didn't think we had to put it in there. So you wait right up to the day of the report, right? Which of the following reporting options is available if the client refuses to provide the written representation and it's qualified or... Disclaimer. Remember I said before that it's going to be a disclaimer, but I need to correct. I corrected that. It's qualified or what? Disclaimer, right? And we're going to talk about these uh, type of reports next time. Qualified means you're saying, well, I did most of the stuff I'm supposed to, but I didn't get a management representation letter, which to me, that would be, <laughs> that would be like, that's why I said, you know, you're going to have to disclaim. I mean, if I saw a scope limitation saying I didn't get the management rep letter, I'd be like, well, go home. You know, why'd you bother? You should have withdrawn, frankly, from the engagement. I can see you maybe disclaiming. I'm thinking step away from the situation if you didn't get this last piece of audit evidence that's covering all these different things that are hard to audit, right? So that's why in my head, I was remembering it as you should disclaim at a minimum and probably withdraw, but I guess you could qualify. But man, that'd be a pretty weird qualification. You know, everything is fine except the fact that I didn't do like a major thing that I'm supposed to do. Well, that's crazy. Subsequent events occur between the day of the financial statements and the day of the auditor's report. Date of auditor's report is what? The 15th, year end is December 31st. We have a settlement of a lawsuit in January. That's going to be put, probably a recognized subsequent event if the lawsuit had already occurred by the balance sheet date. Which of the following subsequent events would represent an event that provides information about conditions that arose following the date of the financial statement. Settlement of a long outstanding litigation. That was already outstanding. I remember I said the case could be like two years old and it finally settles after the year end. That would require being recognized in the financial statements, right? Collection of a past due accounts receivable. 
whatever gave rise to that collection of past due account receivable, what is, whatever conditions existed at the balance sheet date, right? So you would go ahead and potentially debit, debit the account receivable, credit the, um, debit the account receivable, credit the allowance, because you probably had written that off, potentially, right? You would have written that off by debiting the allowance, crediting the account receivable. So this is going to all start to go the other way of what I talked about, right? Then what? Then you're going to go ahead, reestablish the receivable, credit the allowance, and um, at that point, when you credit the allowance back, you may look and say, well, we've got too much in the allowance now. So maybe you're going to debit the allowance to bring it back down and credit the bad debt expense at that point, right? But it could generate a bunch of adjustments that are sort of the opposite of what we said before. It's definitely one that would be um, provides information about because it arose following the balance sheet date. Uh, or, or it is not one of those following. It's before the balance sheet date or at the balance sheet date, right? Okay. An additional tax assessment on prior income. Well, the income had already been made at the balance sheet date, then that should be booked appropriately as an expense, etc., right? Almost that example I gave you, although it wasn't income tax, it was sales tax due in the example I gave you. Loss of inventory result of a flood. Yeah, if the flood happens after the balance sheet day, right? We would disclose but not recognize that. Number 12, the Orange Corporation was audited for the year ended December 31st. The audit was complete on January 25th. Prior to the release report, auditors learned of a two-for-one stock split on February 1st. If dual dating is used, what would be the proper dates of the auditor's report? February 25th, except for the splitting of the stock, of which the date of the report is February 1st. Dual dating. Number 13, auditors have no responsibility to evaluate whether the financial statements properly reflect all known events through the date of, uh, ha have, did I say no responsibility? I don't know why I said no responsibility. Auditors have no responsibility. Did I say no responsibility? Auditors have a responsibility to evaluate whether financial statements properly affect all known events through the date of the release of the report, right? So we have responsibility through the release of the report. Now you're saying, you say, but John, you said that we have to worry about things that happen after the report release date, but those are things that what? Should have been known be for the report release date, right? Okay, things that clearly happen after the report release date is not our responsibility any longer. Otherwise, we'd have to sit there for the rest of our lives wondering if there's anything that happened after report release date that affected any of our audit reports. That sound you hear is all auditors, what? Dying early. Okay, you can never get your hands around that. Okay, so it's what? Up to the report release date, then we're off the hook for that audit, right? If we find out about something after the report release date that existed before the report release date, well, yeah, now we're burdened with what? Notifying those that are relying on the financial statements and asking management to revise. Okay? Management letters, uh, management letters are not a means of satisfying professional requirements to communicate matters related to the client's internal control. It's not required, right? The issues related to the internal control that we think are what? Significant enough that we think are material, okay? Uh, either material weakness or a significant deficiency must be reported to management and those charge of governance, right? If something is of a lesser magnitude, not significant, 
uh, weakness, not material weakness, then those could be included in this management letter, right? Because they warrant management's attention. But be careful. You start putting those things in there, and it's very easy to get tempted to put some things in maybe, you know, you might want to look at this, and then all of a sudden that comes to light later, then you've got to explain, well, why didn't you include it in uh, communication that went to the appropriate levels, whatever, right? Auditors must complete very fa various phases of an audit after the date of the financial statements. The auditor's responsibility for matters affecting the clients extends from the date of the financial statements to the audit report release date, right? Auditors conclude that omission of a subsequent uh, substantive procedure considered necessary at the time of the examination may impair their present ability to support the previous expressed opinion. Auditors need not try to perform the omitted procedure if, and I didn't really mention this, the results of other procedures that were applied compensated for the procedure that you omitted. Okay, so let's kind of review that again because I... I didn't mention that one. Um, you have an option of trying to apply the procedure or what? Applying an alternative procedure. But what I didn't mention was you could look through the work papers and see if there was another procedure that compensated for the omitted procedure. You can cover yourself that way, right? So let's say we had done a subsequent accounts receivable review, but we had done that procedure already but we didn't confirm. We say, yeah, but we did enough subsequent collection review during the, you know, engagement period that we're cool. We don't have to do some more of that at this point in time, right? Okay. Number 17, near the end of the audit, the application of analytical procedure is required, isn't it? At year end. Got to do it. Got to do it at the beginning. Got to do it at the end, right? Do you have to do analytical procedures as a substantive test? You do not, but you may, right? Number 18, long and short CPAs were auditing Island Corporation for the year of December 31st, 2017. On January 11th, 2018, a major customer of Island Corporation declared bankruptcy uh, as a result of an uninsured loss due to major fire in their warehouse on January 8th, 2018. As a result of a material, as a result, a material account receivable from the customer was determined to be uncollectible. Short would treat the subsequent event and provide a footnote about the loss in the 2017 financial statements. Now, this question is kind of cruel because it kind of combines what a bad receivable, which I said is going to be considered what something that existed at the balance sheet date. But not if the bad receivable was created by a fire. That's the key thing that happened, what? After the balance sheet date, that's an unrecognized subsequent event that has to be disclosed, right? So they shouldn't have thrown in the account receivable part of it. You know, that's just trickiness. Okay, if it was just a write-off because of bad you know, financial condition, then that would be recognized, right? This right off the receiver was caused by a fire that happened after. So we like, come on. Okay, if it's something like a fire, disaster, or something that obviously didn't happen at the balance sheet date, then that's going to be an unrecognized subsequent event, require footnote disclosure only. Number 19. Small and tall CPAs completed December 31st, 2017 audit of big company on February 10th, 2018. After the audit report release, 
an outstanding lawsuit against big company was settled for materially more than recorded in December 31st, 2017 financial statements. The amount recorded in the financial statement represent the best estimate of management in the company's attorney at the time the audit was completed. Based on the new information, small and tall should do what? Do nothing. This is things that happen after the report release date, didn't it? Do we know that there's going to be this lawsuit that's going to happen after we release the, re I mean, not lawsuit that happened after the report, the lawsuit was already there, but the settlement, it's going to happen after report release date, that's one of those things, did we be sitting there forever? I mean, what if they settle the case two years from now? Should we then go and ask that they revise the financial statements from two years ago? I mean, that would be ridiculous, right? So once you release that report, you don't have to worry about things unless there was some reason you should have known it by the report release day, right? Then you would expect the revision of the report, etc. Number 20, following the auto report release date, auditors became aware of facts existing at the report date that would have affected the report had the auditors been aware of such facts. What is the most appropriate initial course of action? Determine whether persons are relying on the financial statements. Right? If no one's relying on the financial statements, I mean, but then you get to a point, well, then who the hell cares? Why did they even ask for the audit, right? Quest management disclose the newly disclosed information. Well, that would not be the first step, the initial step, but it is something you would do if you determined individuals were relying, right? Issue revised pro forma financial statements, taking into consider revi revised financial statements. Yeah, but not the initial step. Give public notice that the auditors are no longer associated with the financial statements. That could be a course of action if you ask management to revise and management refuses to revise. Then you're going to what? Give public notice, hey, we're not associated with those financial statements anymore. Okay, but that's if they don't take the appropriate actions, right? Management. Okay. But again, uh, the first initial step is anyone relying on those finances. If not, who cares? But then I again submit to you, then why did we do the audit if no one's relying on the financial statements? So that's not the best, most likely one. How often do people not rely on the financial statements? The audit financial um, well, let's say that um, they're not going to share the financial statements with the third party, yep. but they would like for us to still audit the financial statements because they want some reliability for their own purposes. Then maybe under that situation, no one's relying on the financial statements. But it's highly unlikely that someone's going to ask for an audit for a set of financial statements that they're using for their own purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So for their own internal purposes. So that's why I say, okay, I mean, determine if an individual is relying, but it's very unlikely. Now, maybe the financial statements were 20 years ago or something, and no one's relying on those anymore, and you find out about something at that point, I guess. So I guess they, you know, they write auditing standards to cover every possible situation, no matter how unlikely, which this to me would be very unlikely. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was trying to find out I'm not reliable. So is the financial financial statement still relevant? If the auditor says that they're not reliable? I mean the auditor said they're not qualified. Well, again, let's go through the scenario that's contemplated here, because I think that's what you're asking. Um, we issued the financial statement. Then we have a subsequent discovered fact of something that should have been included in those financial statements that was not. Step one, determine if there's individuals relying on the statements. If not, you're done. People are relying on the financial statements. Let's assume that, right? Then we will ask management to uh, revise the financial statements, and we will notify those known to be relying on the financial statements, right? Now, let's say management says, here, we're not going to revise the financial statements. They're fine. 
then we will notify individuals we are no longer associated with the financial statements. We are, it's not something we looked at in the slide. We are required at that point to notify regulatory authorities. So we would be required to notify if it's a public company, the SEC, any stock exchanges, okay? And our notification of those relying on the financial statements has to be sufficient for the scope of those who may be relying. So the general public, we would probably have to take an ad out in the Wall Street Journal or something like that, a notification in the prep financial press saying, hey, we're no longer associated with those financial statements, okay? Now, before we, uh, you know, if they refuse, we would first, before we start doing all that, taking an ad out and disassociating and all that, we should first turn to the board of directors and notify each member of the board of directors that management has refused to do what we've asked them to do. In a prayer that the corporate governance structure will take over, right? So what happens? We go and we notify those charged with governance. And those charged with governance go, Hey Michael, take this auditor for a ride. He has too many questions. <laughs> Okay. At that point, we may be wise to quickly get out of that situation, notify the regulatory authorities, yeah, etc. So we hope that the corporate governance structure will take over. Yeah, and the book talks about that. Um, one of the big points that it's like we got a problem just long time done, like years back, like I don't know what they did. Well, the CPA firm, whatever the firm is, speaks for otherwise is not responsible for things that happen after the report release date. But it talks about three, four years back. I don't know exactly what you mean. Again, if something happens before the report release date, okay, that we should have known about that we did not, that's what triggers all this subsequent, uh, all this uh, previous, what do they, we call it, uh, facts following the report release date. That's what triggers all that. Something that existed at the balance sheet state that should have been included, it was not. Things that happen after the report release date, I mean, we'd be there forever. We'd have to spend the rest of our lives sitting there waiting to see if there was something that we're not responsible for. Okay. Question? All right, guys. I will see you on Tuesday next week. We will cover chapter 12, okay?